from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Taylor Riggs in New York in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. It is a choppy day of trading full of ups and downs. The S&P 500 now having the worst two days since June of 2020. Plus, of course, the deal is on. Well, at least according to Twitter, we'll get the latest insight from inside Twitter as the company says it is not backing down from that $44 billion takeover from Elon Musk. And as retail stocks slide over ongoing inflation fears, what does that mean for the secondhand market? I'll be speaking about that with ThreadUp CEO James Reinhardt, including why he expects the secondhand market to double in the coming years. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with our very own Led Ludlow in this place I miss most. I left my heart in San Francisco, yeah. Ed. I mean, it's sunny, calm here in San Francisco. The market for some time during Thursday's session looks sunny and calm as well. We call it a choppy day, right, of trading or a seesaw day. Ultimately, we're down six tenths of a percent on the S&P 500, a half a percentage point, four tenths of a percent on the Nasdaq 100. But you contrast that with the declines we saw on Wednesday, perhaps the market more sanguine, but struggling for direction. And ultimately, in the last hour or so of the session, we fell away into negative territory. Also interesting to see yields softer. You see the US 10 year at 2.83 percent. Bitcoin holding around $30,000 per token. It had fallen, of course, in the sell-off we saw on Wednesday. This general risk of sentiment staying in place. Is that the Fed? Is that inflation concerns? Well, we also look at Cisco because corporate earnings season continues. Cisco pretty steadily holding it in declines of 13 14% all throughout the session on Thursday cutting its annual sales forecast, supply chain problems, impact from China. And we're so focused on Cisco because it's really a proxy or a barometer for corporate spending. When corporate America wants to invest in itself, Cisco tends to do well. So cutting its sales forecast, it's an interesting forward-looking one. After hours, we're also looking at applied materials. Key chip maker, of course, lower, a little lower actually by around 2.5%. It had been down as much as 5.5%. A very similar story. It gave a tepid forecast for the current quarter and says the supply chain issues around semiconductors is still there. In some cases, suppliers are running at 50% of capacity. Those are not the things we want to be hearing when we're also worrying about global growth and a recession. Very quickly, Taylor, two big Bloomberg scoops on Thursday that I want to talk about and we will talk about later in the show. First of all, Twitter hire. You mentioned it. According to sources, inside a meeting and all hands on Thursday, a Twitter executive said, A, the deal with Elon Musk is not on hold. B, there's no such thing as a deal being on hold. Another big scoop. Apple actually one of the big laggards during Thursday's session, down 2.5%. But according to sources at a recent board meeting, Apple presented its latest virtual reality headset. You know what they look like. You know what I'm holding up. And that's a sign that it might be a new product that's on the horizon. We need more of those hand gestures from you, Ed. Way to make it interactive. Really appreciate it. Our very own Ed Ludlow. Want to stay, of course, on these volatile markets and welcome in Jason Tauber, Portfolio Manager for Newberger Berman and, and, of course, the Disruptors ETF. Jason, what do you make quickly of just sort of these volatile markets, particularly within your world of technology as well? Well, you know, it's interesting. If, if you look at tech overall, it's actually outperformed on a one-year basis. We have to remember that tech was really, really strong in the back half of last year, and particularly, you know, Microsoft and Apple, which make up a, a large percentage of the tech index. Uh, the first half of the year has been tougher. There have been some high-profile disappointments, you know, Facebook, Meta, uh, Amazon, Netflix. Um, but I do think within our universe, uh, within our universe of disruptive companies, it's been interesting because in the last two days of pretty significant downdrafts in the market, we've seen significant outperformance. Um, and we have to remember that SmidCap Tech and mm. SmidCap Pro specifically has been under a tremendous amount of pressure for the last 12 months. 
and we may be close to finding a bottom, at least on a relative basis. Interesting. So when you talk about some of this mid-cap technology companies, I think of a few headwinds. Rising rates, of course, sort of the classic headwind that we know with some of these long-duration assets. And then smaller down the scale, maybe the less healthy, the balance sheet. When you're thinking about the fundamentals and growth at any cost doesn't work anymore, how does that sort of impact the way you're looking at these companies? Absolutely. That's a great question, Taylor. You know, we've always been very, very focused on free cash flow. So even though we're interested in innovative, disruptive companies and, you know, a lot of their earnings could be out in the future, we also want to see free cash flow as soon as possible. And we want to own businesses that are in really strong strategic positions. So this isn't a, a fear of missing out portfolio. Um, within SMID cap growth, there's actually a lot of interesting names that have uh, free cash flow support. So we're, we're talking about two to four percent free cash flow yields. Companies like Zoom Info and, and Zendesk within medical technologies. Companies like Dexcom, uh, Intuitive Surgical, and I think that investors are starting to realize, hey, I've been paying you know higher and higher multiples for consumer staples companies for safety. They're only really giving me a 4% free cash flow yield. And the reality is these costs are going to hit them disproportionately. So I think that's what we've been seeing the last two days is that the real economy stocks are really going to be hurt by inflation. So there's too many investors hiding out there. And we may start to see a rotation to some of these, you know, skinny balance sheets high pricing power, high intellectual property businesses that exist in the um, in our disruptors portfolio. Within that portfolio, how sort of defensive do you feel like you need to be and making sure that you're also cash on the sidelines for better opportunities? But cash, of course, after inflation is a money loser. Yeah, that I mean, great question. I, I wouldn't say that, um, you know, I don't want to make a call on the market. Mm -hmm. uh, do have concerns of, of how is this inflation going to kind of filter through our economy and particularly hit consumer spending over time. We're obviously already beginning to see that um, show up pretty brightly in, in you know, raw stores and Walmart yeah. and Target, et cetera. Um, so I would say our portfolio is definitely tilted in the, in, in the, in the healthcare sector. Mm. So we do want to be a little defensive from that standpoint. But even those names, if they're high growth, they are down a lot from where they were, you know, nine, 12 months ago. And as I was saying earlier, they're starting to kind of bump up against pretty interesting valuations where you can get, you know, two, 3% free cash flow yields uh, for a company that's growing the top line at 20 to 30%. And if, if you know, we enter into a kind of stagflationary environment and, and real growth becomes elusive, I do think investors are going to come back to companies like this. Interesting, though, I was speaking with Anastasia Amoroso earlier of iCapital, and she said maybe not always looking at valuations is the best way when you're thinking about investing. How much are you really looking at valuations versus then just some of the other big technicals and just sort of the mass sell-offs and indiscriminate selling where valuations look good, but the market, frankly, doesn't seem to care? Yeah, I, I think ultimately, you know, as they say, the, you know, the, the short term market's a counting mm -hmm. machine, voting machine, long term weighing machine. And ultimately, valuation is going to matter. You know, one of our companies in the portfolio that I mentioned, Zendesk, um, you know, has private equity interest that's been kind of broadly reported. I think you could start to see start start to see more of that in the kind of disruptive innova innovation uh, space. So I think we have to stay focused um, on valuation and, and owning good businesses that are disruptive. Sounding like a good CFA charter holder that he is <laughs> focused on those valuations. I'm a member as well, and I'm uh, understanding, of course, uh, uh, what that means. I think when we talk about the bubbles, right, and some of the hysteria in this market, it really was SPACs as well. You know, we understand the disclosures when you think about an IPO wanting to raise capital. Was the SPAC? SPAC market, one of the first indications of a little frothy, a little bit over our skis here when we were taking a look at the peak market bubbles? Oh, I mean, 100%. I, I, I mean, if we look back on this, I think that what happened is during the pandemic, um, it was really these innovative growth companies that had massive estimate revisions because they were kind of leading us through the pandemic. You know, think companies like 
Zoom, Moderna, BioNTech, et cetera. And this just generated a halo on all things innovative and growth. And there's going to be a massive acceleration even once the pandemic is, is over. Um, and, and, and I think that there, there's a lot of herds, you know, herd following that goes on in the market. And I think the equity markets, um, our friendly investment banks, uh, responded by, by taking anything public um, that was remotely innovative. A lot of these companies went public way too early. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, when we look at the fact that, you know, small cap growth underperformed large cap growth by 25 percentage points last year, the most since 1999. And I think a big part of that is just all the supply that was pushed into the market. Um, and, and interestingly, if we look at where investors, so households have been putting money, they've generally been putting it into large cap funds, right? Uh -huh. So you've had this mismatch of supply and demand. And that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, kind of the, the, the mega caps kind of led in the back half of 2021, while some of these, you know, this mid cap space was being decimated. Quickly. Um, he yeah. yeah, no, quickly here. We only have about a minute left, Jason. Curious to get your thoughts on if this is a U.S. story. We've heard a lot of calls that China Tech, for example, uninvestable. Are you a U.S. only focus here within these volatile markets? Within the our disruptors uh, ETF, we only focus mm -hmm. or we only own U.S. listed companies. We own like one ADR, I think. Um, we own no uh, Chinese stocks. Really appreciate it. Jason Tauber, Newberger Berman Disruptors ETF Portfolio Manager, really keeping us up to date on all things big tech and these volatile markets. Coming up with investors significantly pulling back in some of the software stocks as well, we will be speaking with uh, analyst Rishi Jaloria of RBC Capital Markets, how this might affect some of those quarterly results next week. This is Bloomberg. Investors are finding shelter from the deepening bear market sell-off in the cheapest corners of the U.S. tech sector and really pulling back significantly significantly from some of the software stocks. Joining us now, Rishi Jaluria, software analyst at RBC Capital Markets. And it's another sort of big day when we think about valuations and re-rating of some of the big high flyers, a lot of the high flyers during the pandemic as well. To kick us off, broadly speaking, how are you looking at valuations at this moment? Yeah, and, and thank you so much for having me. Look, I, I think we increasingly have to, you know, get away from the froth that we were experience, uh, experiencing for the past two years during uh, the pandemic, and and drill more on on free cash flow and profitability. Uh, and to that extent, I mean, we're seeing some really attractive opportunities out there. You know, we see some really high quality companies like Zoom Info trading at 30 times cash flow. And, and even some of the pandemic darlings that, you know, they're going through some struggles, but we see, you know, Zoom trading at 15 times free cash flow. Uh, you know, we see Viva, a very high quality company trading at 25 times free cash flow. Um, we really like these sort of names and, and, and think the fact that there's actual valuation support on a profitability basis, uh, and, and these are names that we think can can do well in, in, in any sort of environment and, and still have a long runway of growth. Um, we, we are increasingly, though, looking looking at profitability way more than we used to a year ago. And you're spot on. And I'm chuckling a little bit because the previous guest and you were mentioning on a instead of forward PE, we're looking at uh, multiples that include cash flow. And I'm wondering because when the E is negative, the math doesn't really work because you need a positive number in the denominator. How much of a focus is that E positive earnings instead of negative earnings? Yeah, look, with, with SaaS companies, I think free cash flow matters a lot because of just the dynamics of how revenue recognition works, right? Mm -hmm. There's subscription businesses. And so you have to look at free cash flow uh, rather than earnings. I mean, you obviously still have, you know, high quality businesses that you can value on earnings. Microsoft, for example, trading at 20 times uh, uh, forward earnings, and, and that's gap earnings at that. Um, you know, so so you, you definitely have businesses where you can look at earnings. But the reason we always look at cash flow uh, is, number one, it's a, it's a metric that is really hard to manipulate, unlike earnings, and, and number two, because of that whole uh, subscription dynamic I just mentioned. What do you make of the big sell-off, looking at your coverage list, Salesforce, Microsoft? You know, you think Microsoft, massive, strong balance sheet, huge free cash flow, as you mentioned, strong debt ratings. The indiscriminate selling that's been going on in the market, what is that telling you about the future path forward for even these super strong, healthy companies? 
Uh, yeah, look, I, I think you hit it on the head. It, it, it's in, it is indiscriminate selling. And I think what is happening is investors are just fearful, right? And 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 it's more the uncertainty that's killing everything. Um, you know, if we were actually in a, you know, 1990 style recession right now, I think there'd be a lot less uncertainty, but it's the unknown. Is it, you know, are, are we heading in a recession? Are we not? Is it going to be like 08? Um, and, and I think that's what's making investors just sell off everything softer, along with the fact that, you know, all these stocks benefited during the pandemic. Um, and I think it's time for investors to take a look and say, look, let's separate, you know, really what are quality businesses from those that that aren't. And, and you know, where have investors been throwing out the baby with the bathwater? Um, so that's what I really think is happening here. But I think it is creating some opportunity. What are those opportunities then for you within your coverage list? How are you thinking about the strong companies going forward? Uh, yeah, look, we're 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 bullish on on you know Microsoft, right? For example, you know it's pulled back thirty percent off the highs and, and trades at a very reasonable valuation, uh, and and it's one of those names that should do well in a uh, even in a downturn, right? Viva is another name we like, you know, and, and in fact they sell to healthcare, which is itself a very defensive sector. Um, HubSpot is another name that we're taking advantage of on on the pullback, right? These are all companies that that have profitability that you can value on cash flow, have multiple growth drivers to to, to continue growing and. And, and, you know, names that, again, especially Microsoft and Viva, should hold up really well, even in the event of a recession. What about some of the big pandemic winners that you mentioned? Palantir, uh, Zoom, the, the video conference company that we know, DocuSign, we no longer were able to sign in person, so we're doing DocuSign. Was that just a pull forward revenue that we saw? How consistent do you see that revenue and, of course, cash flow going forward? Uh, yeah, absolutely, and and you know I'll, I'll put Palantir aside because we're actually uh, negative on that name. Yeah. Uh, but but on on Zoom and DocuSign, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. They they did pull forward a lot of business, and and they're both very focused on their second act, right? For for Zoom, it's Zoom Phone and, and some of the other adjacencies like uh, Rooms and, and events. Um, for for DocuSign, it's it's CLM Contract Lifecycle Management. Um, they're focused on their second act, and I think the again the uncertainty is what's holding these names back, right? It's why Zoom trades at fifty times cash flow uh, for what I think is a very quality business that that has uh, you know good unit economics and, and really great technology I think it's the best video conferencing technology that exists out mm -hmm. there but all the uncertainty is okay well how many other people are left in the world to do video conferencing once you displace WebEx uh, then where is there to go and so as as they can prove that these second and third acts of their business are are for real uh, then I think we can start to see a re-rating on those stocks the argument has always been companies, even in a recession, even in a pullback, will continue to invest in technology. You've mentioned some of the companies that you really see as recession proof, effectively. What companies don't do well in some of those slow down environments? Yeah, look, I think there's a couple categories. Number one is going to be any piece of software that is a, a nice to have, not a need to have, right? Um, you know, look, I, I, I think you can find plenty of categories of software that is, are more discretionary in nature that if, uh, you know, push comes to shove and you have to unplug them, um, it's okay. But you can't unplug your ERP. You cannot unplug your CRM. You can't move your workloads off Azure. Um, so, so, you know, it's the discretionary items that we think are going to do uh, poorly. And then it's, it's companies that are really levered to you know the VC back businesses, right? I mean, it, it's no secret out mm -hmm. there. We're seeing a lot of uh, VC you know funding dry up. We're seeing you know those companies have to focus on profitability. We're even seeing layoffs, right? And and in, in consumer tech and even some VC backed enterprise uh, software companies uh, and 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 any software company that is disproportionately exposed to the low end of the market um, and, and to this kind of frothy VC uh, backed businesses, we think those ones are definitely at risk in a downturn. Really appreciate it. So smart. Free cash flow. That's my takeaway. Rishi Jaluria, software analyst at RBC Capital Markets. Coming up, Twitter executives toning down some of the tweets and reassuring employees that the deal with Musk is on and not on hold. We're going to discuss the latest. This is Bloomberg. Time now for a Bloomberg scoop. The Twitter takeover drama continues as executives telling employees that the deal with Elon Musk, it is not on hold and it is moving forward as planned with the agreed upon price. Joining us once again is our very own Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ned, I wanted to say here and just discuss our twinsies wedding planning and the producer right. said, no, we have to do Twitter.
we have to do the story of the day, right? Well, there's a lot to talk about. So we're hearing from sources that were in this big meeting, this big all hands, that Vidya Gade, who's the head lawyer, head of policy at Twitter, basically stood up and said, you know, not only is the deal with Elon Musk not on hold, but there's no such thing as a deal being put on hold. Literally a quote from within that meeting. And, you know, this has been in a, an area of intense interest, not just for investors or us in the media, but Twitter users, fans of Elon Musk. And, you know, this was a move by company executive to reassure Twitter employees that, you know, this is going to go ahead and this is what they're working toward. Why the need to even address this? Right. Let's go back to basics. Great question. You'll remember that Elon Musk tweeted several days ago that the deal was, quote, temporarily on hold because he felt that data Twitter had provided in a regulatory filing saying less than 5% of users on the platform were bots was not accurate. He felt that he didn't believe the data and evidence that Twitter had provided and he wanted to know more. And he stated on Twitter in classic Elon Musk fashion that until he had more evidence, the deal was temporarily on hold, quote. But remember, Bloomberg reporting as well that according to sources, in the background, whatever Elon Musk is saying, his advisors, his bankers were getting on with it, you know, working with the other side, working with Twitter to get this deal to happen at the original price, which to remind our audience, $54.20 per share mm. to take Twitter private at a valuation $44 billion. A lot of drama continuing to play out, and I know that you continue to keep us up to date here on Twitter. I, I want to go to potentially a little bit more of a stable growth company here, and that's Apple. We had a great, oh, yeah. of course, story out here from our very own Mark Garman talking about yeah. the headset. I know that you love to do that hand motion and, and really describe that headset for us visually here, but <laughs> showing it to the board, a significant sign of progress. Right. We're talking about a virtual augmented reality headset. Go. You know, I go. don't have a prop, but basically <laughs> sources saying that the latest version of this device was presented to the board recently. The board meets four times a year, but that's a pretty good sign that it's at a stage where it could be real. It could be the next big thing. You look there at that pie chart, hardware so important for Apple, 80% of revenue, but the iPhone dominates. What's the next generation of product? How can they boost services revenue? Well, augmented virtual reality is one way of doing that. And so, you know, we're hearing that this headset has amazing processing power, the same kind of chip power, semiconductor power that its latest generation of Macs has. And in previous years, they've tested their software on competitor hard, uh, headsets. This is a market dominated by Meta, right? The Facebook parent and its Quest 2 device. So can Apple catch up? It's very exciting. Have to get your hands on the chips first. Very appreciated. Right. Our very own Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Coming up, there is some advice to founders from the next guest as they hunker down ahead of what could be, well, a very turbulent time for the fundraising market. We're going to have that story next. This is Bloomberg. It is the single most efficient competitive market in the world, hands down. We should think about how do we have far more companies be public companies where their success is enjoyed by American investors, saving for the retirement or otherwise. And everything that we keep piling onto, the list of obligations and responsibilities for a public company, discourages that from happening. We've seen thousands of fewer companies in our public markets today than 25 years ago. And that's really, I, I hate to say it, but, but shame on Washington for, for really forcing so many investment opportunities outside of the line of sight of the American investing public. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Taylor Riggs. That was, of course, Citadel CEO Ken Griffin speaking earlier at the Bloomberg Intelligence Market Structure Conference talking really here about the dearth of deals that he's seen in the U.S. right now. He also warned how the chaotic markets are also making it harder to look at new, de new deals and ideas. For more on how this is affecting startups, especially as they try to fundraise, I'm joined by Lisa Blau. She is, of course, founding partner at ABLE. Great to have you here. Talk to us about sort of the volatility that we're seeing in the, in the markets and sort of the impact that you're seeing, if at all, on some of the fundraising as well. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Taylor. 
you know, we're really seeing that some of the later stage VC market, you know, shift, uh, some of that turbulence is really um, shifting down a bit. Um, many investors, especially the crossover funds with public and private exposure, they've pulled back or they've simply gone pencils down. And we're hearing about flat or down rounds as multiples start to normalize. We're also seeing, you know, significant interest in selling secondary shares in unicorns and a fair number of extension or bridge rounds. You know, right now, the very early stage, the pre-seed to seed still remains somewhat insulated, but it's really just a matter of time before we see that instability seep into the super early stage. Mm. And many of those pre-seed and seed rounds, they're upsizing the size of their current raise, you know, for a little more cushion so that they have runway given, you know, the, the macro uncertainty that we're seeing in the later stage market. And are you telling your companies to prepare for a little bit of a slowdown, to think about conserving cash, just tightening up your belt and being able to, and I was in Boston, I believe it was two days ago, when I think one of the VCs that I was speaking to told his companies, be prepared to not be able to fundraise for 18 months. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's good advice. It's certainly a good um, framework and a way of thinking. You know, our best advice to any founder at this time is to remain incredibly disciplined on your cash burn and to utilize, you know, an ROI driven decision making framework to prioritize. And, and really, irrespective of the macro environment, we at ABLE have always said, you know, the best companies with outstanding metrics, fundamentals, and a unique competitive advantage will continue to get funded. There, there's still venture funding out there with dollars that will have to be deployed, and they'll go, you know, out to the best, the best founders and the best businesses. You know, and we've also said to our founders, you know, many of them try to optimize for lower dilution and higher valuation, but there may be advantages now to remaining disciplined on valuation to avoid being in a situation where it's hard to clear that valuation at the next round, you know, giving, given the continued challenges in the macro environment. So the shift is no longer a unicorn at any cost, right? Has it been a focus on looking at more or sooner profitability? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's, it's no longer, the message is no longer, you know, growth at any cost. Mm -hmm. It is really trying to, um, to focus on the fundamentals and um, to build, you know, a strategically competitive business um, that's still sort of grounded in, right. in, in good economics. You know, you talked about it in the slowdown. You'll still get funding for the companies with really strong ideas. Where do you, what sectors, where are those good ideas? Yeah, you know, at ABLE, we're focused on, on what we call kind of narrowing the wellness gap, right? Mm -hmm. That's the, the delta that's grown over the past two decades as economic indicators such as GDP per capita, you know, have gone up and to the right, um, while our measures of overall well-being, including physical and mental health, have stagnated or decreased. So we're most focused on overlooked or underserved demographics where there's been historical stigma. stigma. So one area that's been very active for us is mental health. You know, we've invested in Spring Health and Alma and Little Otter. Uh, one in five U.S. adults and kids suffer from a mental health or substance abuse issue in any given year, but over half have never received treatment. Um, the stats really speak for themselves, but it's also an opportunity that's ripe for technological innovation, given the significant supply and demand imbalance that we see in this sector specifically. So I think it's 60% of counties in the US, including 80% of rural counties, don't have a single psychiatrist. And the number of psychiatrists interesting, entering the profession has been trending down. You know, So our thesis is that technology can really um, help unlock a lot of value and opportunity there. And I hear you, but also coming out of the pandemic, this also felt like such a competitive space. I mean, you get out, advertisements all the time of all of these different mental health um, apps here on your phone. So how do you also then differentiate if there is the need, but it also kind of feels competitive as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think kind of going back to, as I said, we've really focused where we think technology um, can make a big difference, particularly in the mental health sector. So we've looked at tools that make the mental health providers more efficient in managing their care. You know, we've looked at services and technology that allows 
personalization for an employee to determine, you know, exactly what care, what mental health modality is most effective for their needs. We've also looked at, at digital services that allow those in rural geographies, as I mentioned before, you know, to mm -hmm. access quality care virtually. Another so that's great, how we tried to differentiate. Yeah, no, wonderful. And I think another great thing here I'm reading in your notes is, of course, backing female entrepreneurs. And if there's sort of a big takeaway from 2020 and the pandemic, it all forced us to stop, slow down, and look around at equality around us. And certainly in your world, you're doing that as well. How are you looking at investing and supporting female entrepreneurs? Absolutely. That's been central to our thesis and our work since Abel's inception. Um, you know, we have about 70 companies in our current portfolio and 60% have a female on the founding team. But we've always said that, that we really invest in the most talented founders and they just happen to be women, right? Our, our sectors that we focus on are consumer, their health, their care. Women make the vast majority of purchase decisions. And we as investors, you know, we're really looking and talking a lot about founder product fit. And we're looking for entrepreneurs that have lived experiences that uniquely qualify them to solve the problem. So, you know, from our perspective, understanding the female point of view is really critical to success and to scale. And, and there has been progress. Last year in 2021, women raised more venture dollars and executed more exits at, at greater valuations than at any point in the past decade. But the percentage share of funding to all female founding teams declined mm -hmm. for the second year in the row. So, you know, the reality is we need more diverse perspectives, more women in decision making roles at investment firms, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's not just it's not just good work. It's right. good business. Women on founding teams, you know, they, those teams perform 63 percent better than all male founding teams. And women led teams generate, you know, like 35 percent higher return on investment than all male teams. So this is, you know, this is not charity. This is good investment work. Really appreciate it. Good investment work is from Lisa Blau, founding partner over at Able Ventures. Really appreciate it. Coming up, closing the gender gap, something that we were just discussing, and now doing that in the digital art world. My conversation with, well, one of the biggest artists in that space. That's next. This is Bloomberg. our crypto report. I'm so pleased to welcome in, well, our, of course, crypto contributor, Shanali Basik, along with Nadia Tulikonikova. She is, of course, one of the co-founders of the feminist protest art collective Pussy Riot and an outspoken social activist. Nadia, so great to um, have you here with us today. First, talk about sort of this new initiative that you have underway and, and sort of the, uh, the more equalizing within the LGBTQ community that, that you're looking for within the crypto world. Um, it's called the Unicorn DAO, and uh, we bring together one of the biggest minds, influencers, artists, collectors in the digital arts space to close the gender gap. Our thinking is that um, crypto and digital space promise to build a new world, and a lot of people in this space believe that the um, new world has to be more um, open accessible accessible for everyone, um, equitable. And um, we believe that if we bring together in the room one of the most influential people in the space, uh, people like Beeple, Sia, Board Apes Yacht Club, Grimes, um, Pussy Riot, and a lot of other prominent artists in the space, um, then we are going to be able to establish a new paradigm. And everyone else who's going to come to Web3 later are going to be uh, following this model of the world that they're going to be able to build where women are equal men. Uh, anyway. I'm really curious about diving into that a little more. Your website also for Unicorn Dow points out some of the issue here, Nadia, that there is not a lot of diversity in the space yet. So when you're getting together with all the members of this Dow, how do you defeat this problem and are there challenges to doing so? Mm, we get together on weekly calls, sometimes we do parties. Um, when it comes to um, membership, we try to make sure that we have um, at least equal amount of members and we have uh, systems in place that um, help to maintain that. Like for example, we have a sponsorship 
program um, that is sponsored by Moonpay. Um, so uh, there are a number of female artists who are not able to uh, contribute 50 ETH uh, for a sheet. So instead, Moonpay pays, pays for them. When it comes to in real life events, um, we obviously prefer to party with um, girls and LGBTQ plus people. So we also, also always maintain um, people who <laughs> we, we watch people who we uh, invite. So it's like it's never a creepy bro party. Um, I think this is one of the biggest problems in Web3 and crypto that the um, culture that is created by crypto bros are just so um, repulsive for a lot of people from the outside. And it, it doesn't allow um, NFTs and to really scale and reach mass adoption. Mm -hmm. And what a story. I mean, this was launched in the 10 year anniversary since your arrest in Moscow for an anti Putin protest. And I'm wondering if you'll talk a little more about the power you found in crypto to bring people together, especially because you were such a big part of what had raised money for Ukraine through the DAO world. Um, I'm, I've always been connected with the, the world of technology because I believe that if, in order to be good, effective activists, you have to be um, also smart about what's going on in the tech world. Um, so I Mm, I love to. I love to use whatever this world um, gives us in order to achieve um, better results as an activist. So, with the same mindset, I came into crypto. Um, I started to actively work in the beginning of last year, um, and but you know my core um, ethos didn't change really um, over the last fifteen years. I started to be feminist and um, and pushing and and activist 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, doing the same thing, trying to achieve the same goals, but uh, with new tools. And uh, for example, uh, when the war in Ukraine started in um, the end of February, we uh, put together Ukraine DAO, and I'm one of the co-founders mm -hmm. uh, of the Ukraine DAO, and we were able to raise $7 million just in a few days and disperse those money in the next 24 hours. And crypto mm -hmm. allows for um, transparency, speed um, right. and efficiency that's not really seen before. The sort of argument against that, though, has been sort of the high flying NFTs, high flying crypto. It's come down a lot in terms of price. Are you worried about entering and continuing in this market when prices weren't what they were a few months ago? I'm not worried because I'm here for different reasons. I'm looking at crypto as uh, as a tool for activism, and uh, nothing really changed in that instance. I also see. I also think that there are a lot of um, use cases of Ethereum applications um, for building better governance models. And um, the founder of uh, Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin, he talks a lot about that. So I'm actually looking forward for decoupling um, lust for money and crypto, and looking at crypto. And I think this. <laughs> this current market allows us to actually take a look at crypto and try to find something better and more interesting, deeper than just, um, you know, means to get rich. You know, speaking of uh, deeper reasons for cryptocurrency, one of the things that your DAO has talked about is reproductive rights and what you've called the summer of rage in, in the release out here. So how do you see that playing out for members of the community to really talk about reproductive rights in the United States? We are working currently on the um, auction with um, Christie's, and the auction is going to be revolving around the topic of reproductive justice. Um, and a big portion of what we're going to be able to raise, we're going to be donating to various reproductive justice organizations in the US. Um, and also, we are in conversations with various, um, with, um, various organizations like Planned Parenthood and Women's March to see how we can actually help them to onboard their members uh, to Web3 to hopefully provide them better governance tools uh, and also fundraising tools for their goals. Really appreciate it. Nadia Tolokanikova, of course, and our very own Bloomberg, Shanali Bostic, really appreciate both of you joining this program. Coming up, it has been a hard week for retail stocks. We're going to be speaking with James Reinhardt, CEO of Online Thrift Shop, thread up on whether they're seeing consumers pull back and, of course, the trends across, across secondhand apparel. This is Bloomberg.
Retail stocks got a big hit this week as investors worry about consumers paying higher prices in the wake of higher inflation. Joining us now is James Reinhardt, CEO of ThreadUp, the world's largest online marketplace for secondhand clothing. And before we get to the inflation conversations, I think the bigger issue underway is, while well, the lack of supply chain issues that at least maybe you're starting to see, is that one area of at least reprieve for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we don't have exposure to China, so we don't have exposure to international production. Um, you know, of course, we still are dealing with freight and labor costs here in the U.S., but, but certainly it's nice to be in a market where, you know, everything that we're selling back to the American consumer is being sourced domestically, you know, from, from the American consumer. So that does give us some insulation, Taylor. Talk to us then about inflation, huge concern. And, you know, one of my bigger concerns is if Walmart and Target aren't figuring out how to manage it, how does everyone else do it? How are you doing it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think the Target and Walmart, I mean, it told sort of different stories about, about the results. I think, um, you know, for us, ultimately what we see is a consumer that seems like they're getting a little pinched, right? Mm -hmm. Pinched at the palm, pinched on groceries, um, you know, you, you can see this across sort of consumer discretionary spend. And so, you know, I think what we're seeing is that this is now a time where discount apparel, you know, secondhand apparel can really shine. And so I think, you know, our job is to make sure consumers are aware of the great value that you can get in secondhand. And you're really seeing that. I'm looking at your 2022 resale report, talking about how the market is expected to grow by 127 percent by 2026. How do you sort of make sure that you're meeting your audience, that you have the right inventory that consumers are looking for at the moment. Yeah, Taylor, that's the tricky part, right? Is it is that it requires some investment right now to make sure that we have the, the products that, that consumers want to buy and that we're really investing for the, the consumer of the future, you know, which is young people. What, where you're really seeing the growth in Gen Z, millennial uh, shoppers is, is their pursuit of secondhand. And I think secondhand has now moved from hey, I'm going to occasionally think about shopping secondhand to really being one of the first places the young people are going. And I think that's a really exciting change uh, for the resale industry. And so we're trying to make sure that that we're there, uh, you know, as consumers are looking to, you know, go back out in the world and return to work. And that's where secondhand can shine. We were showing a chart here about how the consumers are really looking at North America. That area is leading the growth. But how much of this is also a global story for future opportunity? Yeah, the, the global resale industry, this is the first time that we've ever done that as far as our, you know, in our resale report was look at the global trends. And, you know, the global trends are really positive, whether it's, uh, whether it's in South America or it's in Europe or, or Australia, right? A across the globe, resale is growing. And so, you know, I think it suggests that this movement to shop more sustainably is not a U.S. phenomenon. I've said for a long time that the problem we're solving for consumers uh, is, is a global one. And so I think it's exciting, uh, you know, for us to see that type of global growth. I think the global market's supposed to triple, you know, over the next five years. And, and obviously that's weighted more towards North America in the near term. Finally here, you mentioned sustainability. I'm curious during times when the economics pull back a little bit and consumers are feeling pinched. Is it a necessity or is it a desire to actually be sustainable? Yeah, I think what we've been trying to keep top of mind for consumers is that the threat of value proposition is always great brands at great prices. You know, we certainly believe price and value is the number one consideration uh, at a time like this. But we always add the caveat of like, it's great brands at great prices in a sustainable way. And I think young people increasingly uh, are saying, hey, I want to change the way I'm shopping and I do want to be more sustainable. And so I think, you know, now is our time to, to prove that we can deliver value in a sustainable way to our consumer. Really appreciate it. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thread Up CEO, James Reinhardt. And of course, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. We're going to be right back here tomorrow. I hear Emily Chang may grace the building and return. We'll have to see if that indeed does work out. Also, though, don't make sure to check out our new podcast. You can find it on the terminal. You can find it online on Apple, Spotify, and iHeart. This is Bloomberg.